So let's get into it. Um, this is welcome. This is our uh, annual State of the Church address, as it were, a chance for you all and us all to come together and review some of the details of our annual report and our financial statement, the budget for the coming year, um, so that our annual meeting can flow really quick and not get weighed down in the weeds. So um, I would like to just center us with a word of prayer today. Might I do that? Could you join me in the spirit of prayer? Holy God, you who bring us together. With grateful hearts, we come together this morning to review the year behind and feel the hope and energy of the year ahead. Bless this time together. May we be inspired to do your work in the world with the information that is given to us today. Christ, we pray. Amen. So um, I am going to say just a very few words right up here at the top, and then I'm going to turn it over to Don to go through some of the financials. Now, if you haven't had a chance, please grab a couple of the uh, handouts that are in the back. You should have two. One that's a beautiful color document that is our annual report. Um, I look forward to going through that with you um, here after Don's uh, financial discussion. Uh, the other one is, uh, it has fewer pictures in it, but still, do we have any pictures in that one? It has some color in there. Yeah, see, there's a couple pictures in that one too. Um, and so uh, that is our financial statement and the budget for the coming year uh, or for the past year, both, both and. Um, so make sure you have both of those as we're going to be going through both of those today. And I'm, I told Don that I was going to uh, turn it over to him really quick so we can get into the meaty financial stuff. And then I'll be back at the end after we've answered all your questions to start going through that annual report with you. Don? Thank you, Nora. Um, <clears throat> and I do want to say on, right at the beginning that I do appreciate that gesture on Nora's part. It, those of you who have been through this before might remember that uh, Brennan always took the lead. And we are all, I know, on the edge of our seats waiting for him to finish so that we could get into the financials. And sometimes, <laughs> sometimes that wasn't until like quarter two or 10 o'clock. So anyway. Um, we have a little more time to do that. So I'm going to go right into the, um, the financials here, um, page by page. We don't have anything for you to see on the screen, obviously. Um, and for those of you at home, I believe now these are out on the, the website um, so that you can uh, take a look at those as well. So the first page is the pledge report. Um, obviously, for this organization, Pledges are the number one support, um, financial support, funding support for St. Luke. And it's, uh, you can see the trending here um, has been very steady. The top part of this, and, and this is all um, information that is um, calculated by Darla. And again, at the top of this, I want to um, really uh, set out my appreciation and our appreciation for the work that Darla does, both from the standpoint of keeping the, um, the accounting going and so on. But the other part of that, and particularly when we're talking about pledges, is the trust level and the confidentiality um, that Darla provides, uh, which is really helpful, um, both from her standpoint of, of clarifying uh, pledging issues with, with individuals, but for people reaching out to her and saying, what do you think? And uh, anyway. Um, much appreciated for the now 20 some years that Darla has been doing this. So, so as far as the, the, the top portion of this is reflecting the pledge drive itself. So those pledge documents that, that we receive each year. And what Darla does is that she'll look at the prior year and so you can see the categories, pledges unchanged, increased, decreased, new, or returning pledges. And each year there's a variety of how that comes across. This past year now, if you look at, at, the, at the far right, the estimated 23, 42 were unchanged, 19 increased, seven decreased, and there was five that, that uh, were new or um, returning pledges. Um, the other thing you'll see here is that um, typically 
when you look at the pledge budget, which we'll get into when we talk about the budget itself, we're typically going to look at, make a budget that is equal to or less usually than the actual pledges that we receive, because we anticipate there will be some changes. And you can see that that for the past few years we have gone lower that with the budget than the actual um, that we've received, and yet uh, we keep coming out ahead all the time. You know, kind of that St. Luke miracle. Um, and it's one of those things that, uh, you know, you can't bank on, but we, we try to be conservative about that. So you'll see this year, our pledges have dropped, uh, that both in number and dollars. And so the budget itself is going to be right at that number right now. And we'll see how it, how it plays out. Things change during the year. But that is the starting point for this year, is that the pledges are down somewhat. And for those of you who are interested in colorful graphs, um, that's the history down there in, in a graph form. Are there any questions on the uh, pledging part of that? Yeah, Dennis. Right. No, no, and and I'll you know again at the top of this I'll say that that right now our financials are strong, um, but there is some trending uh, that we are going to be looking at and need to look at over the next year or two. Um, as we get into the budget, you'll see we've got a a reserve to cushion that while we kind of figure it out, if you will. The other thing that needs to be said too is that uh, when we look at the demographics of the congregation, over half of our members right now are over 70. So that is a, that's another thing that as far as the trending goes, if you want to say, but um, uh, that kind of goes hand in glove with what we're talking about there. Yeah. Yes. I think that's that's always a possibility. I can't tell you, yeah, yeah. I, I think I think it is, and I think it's been that way here um, because there's some anticipation. And the other thing is that that um, not all the pledges, even though we start the pledge process, as you know, um, in the fall, not all the pledges come in um, until later. And then, um, it, and we'll we'll talk about that. Maybe we get into the numbers, you know, the rest of the numbers. Any other questions? All right. Turning your storybook to the next page. Um, we've got this set up so that you can kind of, um, it's in bigger print, one. Um, secondly, it flows from one page to the other here. This is all part of the same report. Um, let me talk a little bit about the actual numbers for um, 2022, and then I'll get into the budget. You can see we've got total income that is increased, um, increased over budget. A couple things in, in play there. Um, as we saw in the pledging, we received more um, uh, money uh, for pledges than, than we had budgeted. The huge number there is, is members not pledged. So um, these are our members uh, who choose not to pledge or forgot to pledge, um, whatever, and um, still made those payments. Um, so we've, you know, we've budgeted accordingly, but you, again, that's something you never know from one year to the other. The other thing that came through this year was the uh, special offering for Afghan support. So that $12,200 was not budgeted for, change for change was, was higher than we had budgeted and so on. The building use, of course, is the school downstairs. Um, in terms of benevolence and outreach, the name, the, the second category there, um, the uh, we we budget that we. This is one of those categories. Typically, our our operate. This is the operating fund. It's one of the funds that 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 is part of the church operation. Um, we budget this to be 
kind of a use it or lose it budget, if you will. In other words, if a program has a certain budget and they don't use it, it doesn't carry over. It goes back to, to zero, you know, at the end of the, at the, end of the year and, uh, or it, it's, goes to, it covers something else, but then each year we start over with a new budget for, for each category. The only, there are only two places where that does not happen. One is in benevolence and outreach. Anything that is not used in the social justice budget, and it's typically because of timing issues of how it's paid, that is carried over for payment in the following year. And again, then their budget starts over um, at the beginning of the year. So just for example, this year, about 3,800, I think it was, um, was carried over. It had been committed to, but not yet paid out. Um, personnel, oh, well, first, is there any questions on social justice or the benevolence and outreach? As you can see, change for change goes into that as well as in this case, the Afghan support, any special um, social justice offerings. Um, personnel, biggest category we have, no question about that. And this is a very big, um, uh, a significant transition year um, as far as that goes. Um, oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I wanna get back real quickly to social justice. Um, the social justice budget includes um, the garden, for example, 7950, or the 7950 of that 67950 covered the, commun the community garden. And that basically has been in, uh, in the benevolence area or in social justice because of the um, use of that for DIW, for other things. And of course, um, uh, Faith Formations makes use of it too, but that's, that's where the category went. Um, but things like Liberty Church, Beacon, DIW, Pine Ridge, um, we had uh, 54,000 going out to a number of these uh, organizations, ICA, um, and, and some of the housing things for families moving forward. Um, so there's quite a variety here. I won't try to get into it, but just as you, as you know, we have a broad sweep when it comes to social justice um, monies that we provide. As far as personnel goes, again, we're in a very transitional year uh, with Brennan leaving, uh, we have Bill, of course, is our bridge pastor. We have are in the process now of looking for the transitional pastor, anticipating that um, by the end of the first quarter, thereabouts, I think, Bill, you were saying one to three months once we got the MIF out or the, the uh, document out. But. Well, that's kind of normal. Yeah. The, uh, our presbytery has 20 churches in transition. Wow. But we don't, you know, we only need one. It could be tomorrow. <laughs> so it could be tomorrow and it could be And we are special. Yeah. 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 That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Yeah. Um, so obviously the budget is based on assumptions as to um, when that person might start. Um, the other thing that I should say uh, as far as staff goes, um, uh, the session and the um, uh, personnel committee, human resource committee uh, looked hard at what's been going on with inflation and uh, the session determined that all of the staff should receive an 8% cost of living adjustment this year. So that is in the numbers. Dennis? Yeah. So the staff includes uh, David, David Lohman, um, Ann During, who's the church secretary, um, the custodian, uh, who was Randy Lofgren, but is, you know, we're looking for a new custodian now because Randy left. Um, Joe and Brenda, who do the, uh, the cleaning in the morning, prepare the coffee, for those of you who have that in hand early, uh, and Darla. 
Um, and, and I'm sorry, well, you, you were, it's, I was looking at, at staff, not clergy, but yes, uh, Nora is our uh, clergy, obviously. Uh, and you will be seeing um, a, a, a call uh, at the meeting, annual meeting today about uh, as, as far as Nora's um, compensation package. Okay. Um, so the rest of this I can move through probably fairly quickly because they're they're fairly <clears throat> uh, fairly standard. Uh, administrative is supplies and services. Uh, the per capita um, is the the amount that we pay to Presbytery every year based on the previous year's um, membership. Um, and uh, building and grounds, you can see we uh, utilities and insurance are a fairly sizable number. Uh, the grounds expense, maintenance, and improvements. We constantly have a number of those things that, that pop up expectedly and sometimes, but mostly unexpected. The other thing is that there are, um, over the years, uh, we've, we've created a list of um, additional things that we'd like to do in the building, for example. Um, Cliff has, has updated that most recently, things like, um, uh, uh, a new water fountain that could also fill bottles and those sorts of things, dealing with the heavy doors, uh, the accessibility issues around the church about getting in and out of the um, sanctuary, for example. Um, and those things are not in, the, uh, not in the operating budget itself, but we'll be looking at prioritizing those <clears throat> and probably using uh, legacy funds um, to the extent possible to do those things that would improve particularly the accessibility uh, to the church. Um, big thing here, of course, is um, our debt servicing. The good news is with the one mortgage we have left, with, it's about $100,000 right now. And at the, as you can see, at 30 some thousand a year principal payment, that'll be paid off in three years. Um, unless, <laughs> yes, which is good. Uh, it will be debt free uh, and have another uh, mortgage burning uh, out on the back lawn. Um, unless we do something sooner. And I'll get to that in a second. I'll get to that right now. We get to church programs, you know, that's pretty standard. Um, and we, you know, that's 5% that's of our budget, our church programs, which is kind of interesting. Um, so we leverage that quite a bit, obviously, with our volunteers and so on. But that is the, if you see there, those are, those are the dollars that go to church programs, which is amazing that um, for what we do. So you get to the bottom here. The good news is this last year, we came out ahead. Um, much, about 49,000. <laughs> So that's either poor budgeting or uh, uh, good things have done, gone our way. And I'll go with the latter on that. Um, and it is, we, as you saw, we, we, um, we had increased revenues coming in. We had some savings in some areas. <clears throat> um, not that this is to be expected every year. Again, we try to budget conservatively. And that's why you'll see uh, on the budget, we're looking at a 45,000, almost $46,000 deficit. Again, we had a budget deficit last year. There's two things that make me comfortable with that right now. And one that makes me uncomfortable. The uncomfortable is as Dennis brought up is the trending. Um, so we cannot expect necessarily that we're always gonna have this turnaround every year for one reason or another. And we have to be prepared for the other if that does happen. However, as you can see, there's a, a fund balance, beginning fund balance, that the beginning fund balance this year <clears throat> is higher than it was last year. Um, and typically a fund balance, for those of you who have history, and I know there's a lot of you here, <laughs> go way back, we used to maintain a fund balance of $10,000. And that was a little thin um, in anticipation of 
what might happen during the year, although that was at a period of time where typically we were coming way over our budget every year. Now, that reserve is something that we need to be sustainable over a period of time. I'm not advocating that every year we do this because it would only be four or five years and we're out of reserve. But in this transition year, um, I see this as an acceptable situation with the caveat that we as, an, as a congregation and particularly the session um, this year is going to need to focus on <clears throat> the following year when all of a sudden we're back into full staff and, and so on and looking to see where that trending might be going in terms of, of um, pledges, for example. So that is, this gives us time. And again, that's why I feel comfortable with the idea of having another budget deficit, but it's something that we obviously have to uh, be aware of. Jerry. Um, we have one more left. How are we on the solar? Is that all taken Good question. Um, me, oh, good, good point. Yes, and for those of you <laughs> coming through the internet here, the question was, um, where do we stand with the solar array in terms both financially, I guess, Jerry, as well as just its capability? Um, our agreement, uh, we basically have been leasing uh, the solar array, and I believe our agreement comes due in a year and a half. Um, sometime in 24, I believe, or maybe early 25. At that point in time, we have um, the option of buying that at quote market rate. Um, and at the time we did this, that, that seemed like a reasonable alternative that of course would be pretty much depreciated by that point in time. And we were told that it had a probably a 25 to 30 year life. Um, Obviously now technology has gone way beyond what we have up there. Um, the other thing is we have a roof uh, under that solar um, that has at times caused us problems. And um, as we've been kind of talking through this, um, it seems to make some sense to look at doing a couple things at once. One. Um, letting that lease run out, which would require the company that uh, owns those to remove them, if you will, doing whatever we need to do on the roof at that point in time, and then looking to try to, um, uh, well, looking to replace that under a, a new agreement. Dennis. Yeah, I think that's going to be a really important discussion. That's going to be a really important discussion because of the uh, infrastructure that Right. So again, just to reiterate, <clears throat> um, in terms of the um, solar array, uh, Dennis is pointing out that there's um, a variety now going forward of credits available. And, and again, those credits, uh, we don't need those. The company that, that we would be leasing from makes use of those uh, tax credits. Um, and then the other point being the need for maintaining 
um, funding for the grounds uh, going forward. And, and Dennis is right, we have grant money um, for another year or two on that. Um, but uh, part of that is determining what is necessary and then, yeah, looking at it in the budgets going forward. Any other questions? Bill? What's our interest rate on the mortgage? Right now it's about three and a half percent. Um, it adjusts in August of this year. So um, typically the adjustments have not been, um, uh, have not been significant either way, but um, of course with what's gone on with the mortgage rates, uh, it's a good possibility that it could go up by 50 or 75% higher from that three to maybe, I, I'm not sure to be honest with you, but again, typically um, it has not, um, you know, followed percent by percent as to what's in the market. Uh, there seems to be some um, things going on there that, that uh, keep it from going up or down too much. <clears throat> so that's another consideration, um, obviously, as we look forward to next year as to how much of that would be going to um, interest, which would reduce since the payments would remain the same. Um, the interest, uh, there'd be more going to interest and less to principal. Okay, um, now to really do the deep dive, uh, go to the next page um, or in the weeds. I'm not sure which analogy nor to use, but um, this will get us there. So on the left side is <clears throat> what I call the combined balance sheet. And, and again, this is for educational purposes um, to give you a sense of when I'm talking about the operating fund or capital fund or legacy, or in, the, in this case, dedicated, we have four funds that um, make up the operation of the church. The operating fund we've just gone through, but you can see here that um, a big part of the cash um, is, is, in the operating, um, is in the operating fund. And if you look at the, um, uh, the total under combined funds, under 12, 31, 22 combined funds, you'll see that we have um, basically cash, but cash and investments of nearly $600,000 at the end of the year. Um, this is another piece of saying how strong uh, we, the church is financially. Um, these funds are obviously, the cash is committed to different areas, but it's still the cash there. And again, I can remember um, when we were looking during the summer when pledging tended to kind of drop off a little bit, wondering where we were gonna get our payroll cash from, not just the expense <laughs> covered, but the fact that we had um, kind of an undulating um, cash flow. Um, now that's not an issue, of course. So the operating fund, as you can see, has basically cash and some short-term liabilities. Um, that is all accounting needs. I won't get into that necessarily. The capital fund, that is our investment in land and building. And it's at cost, meaning that the $280,000 amount for land goes back historically 40 years, probably. Um, so obviously our land is worth uh, a fair amount more than that, I would say right now. Same with the building. That's basically the initial amount that we spent for um, uh, this building, the other side of it when it was built and any significant improvements um, that have gone into the building since then. Uh, you may ask the parking lot, a million bucks. <laughs> One, that was more recent. And two, that was virtually a gift. This whole lower parking lot and, uh, and all the work that was done with the, um, the drain system and everything else, um, we figured was, and, and then of course what we, what we paid for in terms of the upper, upper parking lot, but even that was subsidized to some extent. But this is the actual amount that we were aware of from the school information. Um, as to what the cost of all of that was. So uh, this is not to say that our parking lot's worth a lot more than the building, uh, but uh, <laughs> it, it, it's a good reminder 
of where we were um, and what we have now. Uh, the legacy fund, um, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but you can see we have basically that's our investment portfolio and then the dedicated funds. And we'll get into that on the right side. But um, I know these are a lot of numbers, but I, I felt it's important to break those funds out. So at least you kind of get a sense of um, how we operate in, in different segments here. So the legacy fund, you can see there are uh, fund categories on the left side. Um, scholarship has been um, uh, very important and very active over the last few years, it's particularly with the Nancy Woolworth Scholarship and with the St. Luke Scholarship. Um, and uh, so that you can see the, um, the additions are gifts, donations that have been made to um, any of those particular categories. Um, the transfers are just between, and I'll talk a little bit about, I'm gonna talk about the one-to-one. -one. And then you can see the, the earnings. Um, this was not a good year for earnings. Um, you may or may not be aware of that, but um, the markets um, didn't shine so much as they have in the past. Um, I must say that over the last few years before this, um, we've been quite blessed with um, increases in the portfolio, even it's been fairly conservatively invested. Um, and then you can see the disbursements. The one-to-one -one fund is, is something that Brennan um, helped create a couple of years ago. Um, and this is one where undesignated memorials, for example, will go into this. And at the end of each year, half of the earnings of that one-to-one um, -one fund, which is a permanent endowment kind of fund, um, half of those, as you can see within the transfer column there, half goes to property and half goes to social justice. So that's kind of getting, hearkening back to whatever extent you can see <laughs> um, to our old one-to-one -one vision um, that, that we um, attempted to follow over uh, a number of years ago, um, which had its own idiosyncrasies in terms of how it was calculated and so on. But um, again, an opportunity here to um, create earnings and, and transfer those to be used in areas that we are now finding need in and then the balancing the one-to-one the -one kind of balance with social justice. Any questions on legacy? Mm -hmm. I know last year the session talked about their investment strategies in terms of looking at how socially and environmentally responsible they were. I, I can't remember what actually happened in that, whether we did or we didn't make the changes or how we could address them. But if we did, is, is this how would the earnings be affected by as we raise the investment? Um, okay, the question was did we? Um, we had talked about um, being, well, more observant of the social um, justice uh, and so on within our investment portfolio, which already had been pretty well focused, um, getting away from um, guns, getting away from uh, um, environmentally, getting away from uh, gas and oil and that sort of thing, mostly. Um, Yes, the, and the question was, did we switch? We did. Um, Mid-year, we moved over to um, another fund, uh, and that was, that was based on negotiations with um, session members in terms of what that investment was. So yes, we have um, refocused um, the investments in that in a, with a new portfolio, brand new portfolio. Okay, finally, the, uh, the dedicated fund. I'll leave you a little time here yet, Nora. We're just pendulum swinging. Pendulum yeah, swinging yeah, I know. Who knows what next year is going to bring, right? Amen. Amen. <laughs> so uh, I just, a quick uh, update on the, um, the kitchen project. As you can see, um, our original budget was $120,000. And if you look at where that came from, um, 40000 plus some earnings uh, during the period of time came from legacy. We got a grant for 20,000. Campaign donations, the big one here, $78,000. Uh, 
Over $78,000 were raised for that kitchen campaign. The project itself turned out to be, um, well, Cliff, you're off a little bit here, 119,733. Oh, Cliff's gone, sorry. <laughs> um, but obviously right on budget in terms of uh, the, the project costs. And then we had a, a benevolent sharing that was part of that um, proposition in terms of the campaign. So 15,000 went out to, I believe, ICA, and I can't remember, um, there was somebody else, I think, that received that too. And there's a little left over that I think is, was just timing um, as to um, what that might be used for. But that gives you at least a sense of, um, that's fait accompli, um, whatever the French is. Um, uh, but it was a very successful campaign, and obviously the result was uh, um, exactly what we were, hopefully, what we were looking for. Um, finally, the dedicated funds. Um, so dedicated funds, uh, as I say, the operating fund basically zeroes out every year and starts over. But when you have a carryover, as I mentioned, in terms of social justice, we have to deal with that somehow on the books. And so uh, the, de the dedicated funds are, again, individual funds that have money to begin with. Money comes in, money goes out, and there's a balance every year. Um, and so these are, are funds that can be tapped. Uh, various um, committees, focus groups have responsibility for these. Um, I can't give you a lot of detail on all of them because I don't um, necessarily see all those, but you can see that we have um, money for group events. We've got building and technology that keeps um, adding every year for, again, projects that come up that we need to be able to fund. You can see the capital campaign fund. That was the kitchen fund that had its own line item. And then benevolence funds. Um, and these are generally um, uh, two things going in here. So this, was, this would be where that $3,800 carryover that I was telling you goes into. But it's also situations where we have, um, uh, we've allowed, if you will, um, funding from members for organizations that may not be 501c3s, in other words, that don't have their own nonprofit um, uh, uh, um, approval by the IRS, um, but they've been vetted by um, uh, social justice uh, focus group as being deeming relevant to what our mission is and that if quote we had the funding we would be open to doing that so that's um, the the rationale if you will for providing that uh, flow of money through the through the church and you can see seventy six thousand uh, dollars basically came in and, and went out there's a you know a balance left over here again for timing but that's part of our um, if you will, part of our social justice, part of our benevolence um, outreach um, as well. And so I, I, I want to make sure that um, people are aware of that because um, uh, there's uh, potentially the thin line between somebody looking at that and saying, well, that doesn't seem right. But again, we've, we've made sure that, that these are, are not just pet projects that somebody decided they wanted to tax um, deduction for, but that we are really, um, this is part of our mission. It fits within our mission and has been uh, vetted that way. So, Jerry, <laughs> start from the back and work forward. Um, you know, you, you phone system some sort, actually? Yeah. Um, so, is that coming out of this uh, building and technology fund? Or it, it, we'll see what it costs. First of all, um, there's there's a few that, that would be the probably the first place we would look. Second place would be the account and legacy for the building as well. But you're right, um, it's it's uh, uh, it's necessary, and we need to get to a new level. Obviously, not going through the same lines and so on. But good point, Peg. Is it academic with that on that uh, first area where it talked about the social justice totals? And then you add like the kitchen benevolence and the the bottom the line, and that that would yeah all added all add it's all additive exactly. 
Yeah. Do you have an example of like an organization um, well, some of um, yeah, I can tell you, of, <laughs> of the 76,000, three of them account for about 60,000 in Britain. I and mean, a few others uh, have been supporting for years. One is a, a clinic, the Cassin Valley Medical Center in rural Malawi, affiliated with Dr. Chiro Morongo, who's now deceased, but uh, we, our church has been familiar with that. For years, we're also supporting the community center for uh, kids in a very dangerous slum outside Bogota, Colombia, that Alan Grossstein and is very heavily involved in. And the third one is um, a project supporting women and children in rural Uganda that I'm uh, involved in through uh, Alan Gross and those of uh, Lynn Julie and I have known for years. And then uh, some various and sundry, a couple others that are most well aware of that. Uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, yeah. So, the, again, for those who are watching, the, the question was relating to um, examples of what goes through that benevolence line um, uh, for special uh, payments out through uh, by members. And the answer was for several. Um, uh, uh, programs and so on in other countries, um, particularly in South America. And we've also vetted a few worthy individuals over here. So been a there's there's been some, yeah, some scholarships and, and individual support as well. Yep. All of this is vetted by committees within the church and has been for years. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions before I turn over the remaining two minutes to Nora? <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you, Don. This is why Brennan always took a half hour up top. No, it's great. It's important. Yeah, I oh I did. Yeah, yeah, you would cruise through it. Um, no, this is good. I this is nice to get a good deep dive to have plenty of time to reflect on these things, get the information, um, to recognize those international efforts that haven't had the sort of 501c3 treatment because they're developing in developing countries. Um, I have some prepared remarks about the state of the church that um, in mostly I'm going to get to at our annual meeting later. Um, recognizing we have about 15 minutes here, and I want to be able to open it up for some deeper dive questions on the annual report that's in front of you as well. Um, so I do want to respond to a couple of things that I heard um, Don say and heard of all us all here. Um, I want to recognize that, uh, as Don said, the state of the church is strong financially. Um, we are not struggling to pay payroll or to meet our debts, whereas uh, 10 years ago, is that 15, 20, 25. 20, 25? Okay. 2025 when the congregation was all over 75 years old, right? You weren't all over 75 years old back then. Okay. So even though we do have this dynamic that half of our congregation is over 70 financially, we're in a much stronger place than when the general age of the congregation was lower. So that's one point that I just wanted to raise up and notice. I also want to raise up um, that, so 50% of the congregation is over 70. That means 50% of the congregation, half of our congregation is under 70, right? Maths, we're doing maths today. Um, and you know, uh, one of the things that I'm gonna be preaching on next Sunday is that congregational survey that we all took. Um, coming in. And one of the things that that listed off was uh, some demographic information for our congregation. And yeah, we, we do have a solid chunk of our congregation that's over 70. But then the, it's not that the next chunk, it's not that we have 50% of people who are 55 to 70. What, what do you think it is? 55 to 70? What do you think? Any guesses? Yeah, yeah, it's about 20. Which then if you take the next chunk, which is about 30 to 55, that's about 20. And if you even go even lower than that, we have about 20% in that lower under 30 category as well. Now we don't see them Sunday morning quite often, right? Amen. 
And yet they still took the survey. They still, I know, I still know them. I see them on, at, they have pet projects and things going on. Lives are different. Sunday morning is a time that is convenient for um, retirees, certainly. And for working young families, it's the one time that they can maybe sleep in a little bit. And they're not just dead tired from the work week the week before. And so there is grace that we can offer to not see them on Sunday morning. But as we remember all those different dynamics at play, as Don mentioned, we are coming into a transitional year and it is very common in transitional years for pledging in particular to become more conservative. Well, I don't know what's gonna happen in the year ahead. Everything might go chaotic. Like there's, there's a lot of reasons why people aren't as strong with our pledges. And yet I am reminded that from our, our money that came in for non-pledge dollars was over 100% what we had budgeted. We budgeted 20,000, we got 44,000. That's a big deal, y'all. I feel like that, that like should get more cred than it does. That's pretty cool. That just because people aren't pledging anymore doesn't necessarily mean that giving is way down and that people aren't seeing the merit of our community. You know, one of the metrics of that congregational survey is what would happen if your community disappeared? Would the community care? And strongly it reported, yes, the community would care. We make a strong impact. We support so many organizations here and internationally, which is really cool that we do that humbly without tooting our own horns about it sometime. But here we are at the annual meeting, so I'm gonna toot away. Um, also the fact that we're making faithful decisions with our investments. We're not going for whatever is going to give us you know, guaranteed highest income returns. We're looking to be faithful with our dollars. And that's a big deal too. In a time when corporate greed is off the charts, it's pretty cool that us as an institution are saying, you know what, We're, we might not receive as much back as if we invested in Halliburton or big oil, but that's okay because we have faith that we're gonna be okay. And this is how we live. If we can't live out our faith with our dollars, how, how can we? So in an era when younger people are seeing and calling out the hypocrisies of the institutional church. I am so proud to be serving a church that says, we don't do that. We put our faith where our dollars are. That's a very cool thing. So, um, you know, I, I, I wanna look back at 2022. That's just some responses to the financial setting and to remind us to keep things in uh, perspective. And as we look back at 2022, um, this really was, I'm thinking of it as a benchmark year because this was the first year that we really got back to being together in person, indoors, after unprecedented several years of not being able to gather in person. And our worship attendance is up both in person and virtually. And we always said, you know, we're not looking at attendance numbers as a metric to like gauge our success, right? Which is also cool that we're not looking at worship numbers as a metric to gauge our success. And it's pretty cool that for worship, our numbers continue to grow. People are coming back both uh, in person and online. Our financials are looking pretty steady. And this is not in the middle of the 1980s, which was the big church boom heyday in America. This is 2023, when churches are shuttering and closing and struggling to pay their payroll. And pastors are going without pay because we gotta keep the lights on. We're not struggling like that right now. This is positions of success and strength as we move into a transitional year. So as we talk about, you know, there's 20 churches in transition and only four transitional pastors, whatever the numbers are, something like that. 
we are a very strong, appealing looking congregation from the outside. And I say that with all honesty. Not only are our financial strong, but our giving and our support of other arts outside congregations is still continue to be strong throughout the pandemic era. We have continued to be dedicated to the division of Indian work and our connections there. Families Moving Forward has continued throughout this time. We've been helping them out as they've been doing hotel work and we're looking at what the next um, evolution of that is going to turn into in this coming year. The West Metro uh, Climate Hub is kind of our baby. We have several congregations of different faiths. We have uh, Bet Shalom uh, Jewish Synagogue. We have uh, the UUA Church over here in Minnetonka. Um, some other congregations too, who have all said, you know, we have different faith backgrounds, but we all care about this world and we come together. We just hosted uh, nearly 100 people in our sanctuary a couple of weeks ago talking about all these tax credits that are available to us. That's really cool. When you talk about our impact in the community, that is a major part of it. Our Change for Change has come back this past year, which is so great, right? I don't know how many people have change anymore, but we, but we still keep getting some. We get some dollars and change in there. Maybe we'll change the Change for Change. I don't think we will because it's catchy. But the point is we keep um, not only have a strong sense of our institution and our viability for the coming year, but we also have support for our outside partners to make sure they are strong for this coming year as well. And if the pandemic has taught me anything, it's don't get too far ahead of yourself. I'm looking at this year, 2023, and I'm saying we're in a good spot this year. So let's ride it. Let's like lean into that good vibes of what's coming down the pipeline this year. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what's coming this year in 2023 during our annual meeting. So be sure to stick around for worship for that. But besides all that uplifting stuff that's happened this past year, you know, we as a community have been able to come together and grieve together this past year as well. We have lost some major patriarchs and matriarchs of our community this past year. And the past, and if we remember 2020, we lost some that year too, and we couldn't come together and gather and mourn. So to be able to share that communal grief together, as odd as it sounds, is a highlight of our year. Because that is real and it is, the church is one of the few places where people can come together and share their grief and be supported and cared for in that. So thank you to um, Sandy Zeist and our uh, funeral committee, to um, Connie and the deacons for all the work that you all do. It is important work that maintains our connections to the community. In a time when churches are shuddering around us, those people, those, those people who need those connections, who can't have those churches anymore, are going to be looking for somewhere else. And I am proud and hopeful that we can continue to, dare I say it in a transitional year, grow? I don't know. I don't know. But I'm looking at everything on the table here, and we're in a really strong place. And... <laughs> And I don't say that just like trying to puff things up right here. I'm saying that because I hope by now you all know I'm going to tell you straight about it. So this year um, behind us, this year has really been one of reconnection, coming back together, continuing the work and finding new ways of interacting with each other. Because I don't know about you all, I actually I do kind of know about many of you, but um, for me, over the pandemic, life radically changed for me and my focus, and how I live it, and how, and not just my transition, but for um, everything else, just the way I interact in the world, and my care for my community, and the gratitude that I can share with a room full of this many people who I love and care about. We can do this, and as we come together this past year, and this year ahead, many of us have histories with each other, but some of us don't, and many of us have new histories to share. What have we been doing for the last couple of years? 
It's, we can't just sort of say everyone knows our rhythms. We're all in different rhythms now. And as we start blending our rhythms together in our communal worship time and our communal uh, spaces, let's remember to share those joys and those pains and those trials that we've been through so we don't just hold them for ourselves. We get to share that with our wider community this year, which I'm so grateful for. Because again, church is one of the few places where we get to share not only our joys, but our burdens. And we all carry them together. So as we look forward to this year, um, you'll get like, they're going to get two minutes to ask questions here, Don. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, as we look forward to this year, um, especially in terms of, there is one dynamic that I would lift up was half of our congregation is over 70. Many of you are still in key leadership positions for many of the ministries that you serve. And uh, coming up in the spring, I want to uplift in worship a dialogue sermon series where we uplift member ministries. And we get to hear about what people have been doing for the last few years or decades and be inspired. And my, my hope is that as we share those life-giving ministries with our congregation in worship, that that 50% who are under 70 will say, that is so cool. I want to get involved with that. So that we can make sure that not only does our institution survive for the next 50 years, but so do these life-giving ministries, families moving forward, to name one amid the sea of ministries that we do. So I'll go into more details about what's coming up in the year in our annual meeting. Um, as I've been chatting, I'm, uh, has anyone looked at the annual report? Do you have any questions about the annual report that you wanted to bring up at this time? You have two minutes. <laughs> oh yeah, sure. Don's gonna do a plug while you're thinking. So you'll have one minute. Yeah. So this is just too easy. So to Nora's point of, of the number of, the of following me, so I'm just gonna stand here. Don't oh, yeah. okay. Well, that's fine. Um, so the finance committee is 100% over 75, um, just to put things in perspective. So I am looking for new blood, so to speak. So if anybody is interested in joining, we'll do treats if that's necessary to incentivize. But um, anybody you know of, not just this necessarily this group, but anybody you know of who um, has some accounting genes in them that they might want to make use of, um, let me know. Uh, we'd, we'd love to add some new members to the group. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Yeah. In the uh, annual report, many of them are Chris, some of them are Brennan, some of them are me, but in general, it's probably the three of us. It's a fair bet. Many of them very great, especially that one on the cover. Uh, that is definitely Chris Sullivan. Yeah, lovely images. Yeah, Gail, what's up? Yeah. Yeah, by the numbers. Yeah. Yes, the older Our Whole Lives programs. Um, meeting up with the Our Whole Lives programs for our youth and children um, has been such a meaningful offering for uh, for those people who are not in the under 35 category anymore, who aren't youth anymore. Um, we've had something like 20 some odd people graduate from our older OWL and we'll have another one coming up in the spring. So if you've heard the hype and you wanna see what it's all about, register for that. One other dynamic that's gonna be um, pretty paramount in this coming year is, as I said, that sense of rebuilding community and uh, reaching out. And you know, I have been talking with some lay volunteers and I am confident that we'll see the return of the Four Bay Dinners this year, which is a dinner program to essentially just combine members together to have a meal together outside of church. So you can talk about your pastor behind their back. No, I'm just kidding. So you can uh, chat and share your lives together outside of this community in a new space. And so we'll be um, hopefully pairing up those newer members who have been here five to 10 years with the older members who've been here 20 to 30 years. And, um, and then also with a little twist to invite um, some other members from our wider community to share those meals as well. So stay tuned for more information about the new four by eight program 
And uh, any other final questions before we adjourn this time together? Well, seeing none, thank you so much, Don. Can we give Don and the uh, financial committee one more, one more of these? Thank you. And if you want to get such a boisterous applause next year, talk to Don about joining the finance committee. Thank you all. Great job, Don. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I